Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in anticipation of just worshiping you. We pray that we will be able to worship you in spirit and in truth, and that ultimately we will be able to be committed to what you, your will, above all things. May we give ourselves over to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. How you doing? Good. Can I have a volunteer this morning? I'm looking on that second row mostly. One of you. You're on the end. All right. I want you to stand over here. Now I want you to walk over to me and give me a high five. All right. That was easy, right? Go back over there. Now I want you to do the same thing, but I'm going to put a few restrictions on you. You, you cannot bend your elbow, so your elbow's got to be out like that. You cannot use your left eye. And you cannot use your right foot. Now come give me a high five. Yeah! All right, I owe you a piece of candy. So what was going on there? Was that, which one of those was easier? The high five. The high five, the, the first one? Mm -hmm. So just coming up, walking up, and giving a high five was a lot easier, right? The second, one was hard. second one was hard. Why? That's right. He was really restricted, right? There's, there's not a lot he could do. Couldn't use the hand, couldn't use the hand, couldn't use the elbow, couldn't use the, the foot. You had to kind of hop along and how, how did you do on balance there? Did the the eye mess everything up? Maybe I should have done it from the other side of the room, right? You would have ended up hitting the pew. I agree. 
we, we don't want anybody to get hurt this morning. We are not going to the emergency room. But, well, what, what is the point of this? If one of, our, one, one of the parts of our body is not functioning, it kind of messes everything up, right? And, you know, we might be able to work around not being able to bend an elbow, but, you know, the eye really, really messes up our balance, and the foot, you can't really, yeah, it, it messes up the balance even more. What am I getting at? Well, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul makes the statement that we as believers are one body of many members. He says, we each have a specific function, and we each have something to contribute to the church. We, God has gifted us in different ways. And when we aren't engaging in the church, when we aren't actively being a member, things don't function right. We, we don't move as one. We might get tripped up. And so I would just encourage you, you know, you, you're still young, but... Uh, there are ways, you are important to this church, and you have ways to contribute to this church. You can help out in different ways, even if it's just being a, a little ball of sunshine. <laughs> well, maybe not you guys. <laughs> You're a ball of sunshine. But, all right, <laughs> let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for each and every member of this church. I thank you for all of these kids, and we just pray that you would bless them and you would show them how you are gifting them and making them the future and that they are important to you. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to give these gifts back to you. You have blessed us so well, and we just want to be thankful, and we want to show that thankfulness through this offering. We pray that you would bless it, and you would bless us through obedience. In your name we pray and we ask. Amen.
I am pleased to announce that whatever illness I had is gone. Whatever came across my came after my family, it is eradicated. My boy's doing great, and I think he got a little stir crazy because now he wants to get into everything. No, don't touch that. You know, it's it's cute. He throws a little bit of a fit when he can't touch everything, right? Yeah, he he needs to get over that, right? <laughs> so. But, it's still hard to resist giving him things when he sees it up on a shelf and goes, oh. It's like, no, you can't touch that. It's breakable. Uh, he's going to try it anyway, right? So, but thank you for all of your prayers. Thank you for all your support. Um, we definitely appreciate how well this church tries not to get everybody else sick when we come here. We fist bump, we elbow, you know. Some, I, I was over it, but nobody wanted to come near me. And I, believe it or not, I appreciate it. It's a little bit like, oh, nobody wants to say hi to me. But I appreciate it. You, you don't want to get sick. And uh, we, we are unified in that desire. Last week, I, I closed a series on prayer with the high priestly prayer. And uh, do any of you remember what Jesus prayed about in that, in that message, in that, in that prayer? To the Father. He started out by praying about himself that the Father would glorify him, return him to that position that he had before he came to earth, return him to that glory, that status. He, he then moved on and he prayed for his disciples. He bragged on them. He bragged on them to the Father and he said, they have learned everything. They've got this down. Protect them. Protect them. I have been keeping them safe from what the devil has been trying to throw at them up till this point. And I need, Father, I need you to take that on and protect them from here forward. And then he closes the prayer by praying for who? Us. He prays for all future believers. He prays for his church. And he says, it is my wish, unify them. Keep them unified. Well, that really sticks with us because it's about us. And we say, well, if this is so important that Jesus would pray this, he would pray for us the night that he was betrayed, the night that he was arrested, going to the cross, what did he know? What did he see coming down, down the path? He must have foreseen that there was trouble coming for the church, that there is something that was going to come at us and try to divide us. Otherwise, pray for unity. Why, why pray for unity if there's not going to be something to cause division? And so he must have known that there would be the constant threat of division in the church because that was on his mind. And so this is a lot of what the Apostle Paul is dealing with as we, we go into our text this morning in 1 Corinthians 12. The Corinthian church, uh, what's the best way to put it? It is known as a troublemaker church. Uh, th this church was constantly a, a pain in the neck for Paul. He had churches that he planted, churches in Ephesus. Well, every church has their challenges, he loved Ephesus. He loved the Thessalonians. Well, he loved all his churches, but when he get to the Corinthians, it was just one thing after another. Why can't they get it, get it together? Corinth was a military port town on the coast of Greece. And so because of that, it was a great hub for travel. People would just make a stopover because it's a, it's a great place to just, you know, make a pit stop. And because it was a military town, well, this made it fairly wealthy, all of this travel. And uh, in addition to that, it also made it a great place for cults. You know, whatever can come in. Everybody from, the, from around the world is coming and stopping here, and so they're just setting up shop. And so the Christian believers in here, in this town, were in a constant struggle for their faith, because of everything that was around them, all of these influences coming in from all over the different parts of the Mediterranean and the world. 
And uh, I mean, you got a lot of military guys down there too. We love our military. But uh, you know, some of them are probably a little rough around the edges. And so th this, this is just to say that this entire city is just full of people that, and influences that could make it really difficult to be a Christian. So we don't really know the full extent of what was going on, but we know that one of most of the issues in the book of Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, have to deal with authority. Paul is, is talking to them in one way or another about authority. We, we, we are having these issues of authority. So this, he even starts the letter by appealing to the Corinthian church, remain unified under Christ, stop bragging about who baptized you. It's not that important. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. Paul actually says, I'm actually glad that I only baptized two of you because uh, I don't want you to say, hey, Paul baptized me. That means I'm better than you. And so they were one-upping each other. They are suing each other. They're allowing perverse immorality to come into the church, and they're okay with it. They are arguing about the hierarchy of slaves, men and women in the church. And by chapter 12, they're even bragging about the gifting that God has given them. Oh, he gave me tongues. Oh, he gave me prophecy. Oh, he gave me the gift of encouragement. Man, that's much more important than whatever he's gifted you with. And he's just, <laughs> and is causing division in this church that people are acting and saying that they are better than one another. The church is really jacked up. By the time you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it appears that some of them had even mounted a little bit of a coup effort. They come in and they said, Paul, he's not a real apostle. We shouldn't listen to him. Really? Paul had a few words to say about that. I recommend reading it. But they were starting to reject him. And it was breaking Paul's heart. He had sent Timothy. He had sent Titus. And he was, he was trying his best to save this church and say, stop. We need to be unified. We need to come back together. Because why? We are under Christ. Paul loves this church. Even though all of this division, he says, I'm not going to throw you away. I love you. God loves you. And so at the beginning of chapter 12, Paul is starting to address this division because of these different gifts. And he is saying, there are many gifts but only one spirit. Verse 6 even says, it is, the, it is because it is the same God who is working all things in all people. And so this is where we pick up this morning. Let's read in verse 12. For even as the body is one and yet has many members... And all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. So the first thing we see is we see the identity of the body. What is the body? Well, it's one body made up of many members. Uh, Paul uses the imagery of the human body. Uh, I don't know if uh, you have ever taken an anatomy and physiology course or a biology course, uh, but anyone who has taken them knows the scientific terms for these parts of the body. Not everybody needs, know, needs to know what the uh, quadrate tubercle is or uh, the mandibular fossa. Small little parts, huh? There are many small parts, but you have one body. It's really hard to grip something with your hand without using your fingers. People have tried. If one little thing is out of whack, it throws everything out of place. There are many small parts. It is the structure of how you are put together. 
When we talk about the body, we talk about structure and function. The bones are your structure. The function is your muscles and how it pulls on everything and gets you to move. If a body doesn't have structure, it can't function. And so we start out by saying we are many, but we are one. As the church, we should know how we are put together. Who are we? We have to ask this question, who am I? In terms of this body, who am I? Am I a finger? Am I an eyeball? Each small part should know who they are and how they contribute to the greater whole. Why is this important? Well, as of 2010, LifeWay Research concluded that 9 out of 10 churches in America is declining or growing slower than the community they are in. They might be growing, but the community is growing faster. Either way you look at it, we're losing ground. And likely, that was almost 10 years ago. It's probably still there, if not slightly worse. How do you get worse than 9 out of 10? 10 out of 10. Back in April of this year, a Gallup poll found that church membership across the country has dropped significantly over the last 20 years. We are 20% less likely to have a millennial join this church than we are a traditional, somebody who was born around 1945. And that is just of the believers. It is estimated somewhere around 15% of millennials actually believe in a God. And of that 15%, we're, we're likely to get mm, roughly 60% of them, maybe. This is in part due to our culture becoming more secular. There's lots of things we can try to, try to pin it on. But this is also partially due to a growing distrust of organized religion. Yeah, you, you might get them to come, you might get them to check us out, but join? Uh, I don't know, that's too big a commitment for me. You guys might do something weird. In his book, I Am a Church Member, Tom Rayner, former president and CEO of Lifeway, makes a suggestion that although we can try to put the blame on all sorts of things, ultimately we might have to look in the mirror. He makes this claim that we have enjoyed country club membership in our churches, which is basically a way to, to say, if you think about a local country club, you pay your dues and you get something back. You pay your dues, you have access to all the amenities, you have all of the, the stuff that comes with it. You get to play golf. Might even have a spa. If you pay your dues for membership, you receive the amenities, you receive the services, you get perks and privileges. Members get served. But Paul states that the church is one body of many members. We are brought together by one spirit, one God, one gospel. We don't get served, we serve. In fact, all the way back in John 13, we remember the high priestly prayer. Jesus ended it by saying, I want you all to be unified. Well, how did he start the Last Supper? John 13, verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then the Lord and teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who sent greater than the one who sent him. He tells the disciples, you lead by serving. Church membership is not to get served. It's not what we get out of it. I hope you know that you don't pay a tithe as a membership do. That is not, hey, I pay this, so I'm a part of this church. You pay it, why? 
It's a response of thankfulness, obedience, and worship to our Lord. He has blessed me. Let me show him how much I love him, that I will bring it back to him. We are called to be fishers of men, not keepers of the aquarium. Being on the church committee is not meant to be a way to get someone's agenda pushed through church politics. It is meant to be a way to serve the Lord and to serve this community. Being a part of our choir is meant to serve the Lord and worship. Being a part of helping out our youth is meant to help raise a generation to know and love the Lord, to disciple. The different parts of this church, there are many different ways, many different functions, many different giftings. And as with the prayer that we just went through, we start by saying, I need to get myself out of the way first. I need to get my focus on God because if not, I'm going to try to push my own agenda. I am going to try to turn everything my direction. And that's not what we are. We are part of a body. The hand just doesn't do what it wants. The eyeball doesn't just do what it wants. The heart doesn't just do what it wants. Because if any of you have had any health issues, you know that if something starts doing what it wants, it really messes things up, doesn't it? Hmm, my heart decided it wanted to beat just a little bit off. My knee decided it didn't want to work today. Division is caused by selfish egos, but unity is formed by selfless service. If the church is to function and grow properly, we must put aside our privilege and do what is best for the whole body. Is Christ honored and worshiped in what we do? Is the gospel shared? Or am I paying a due and getting what I want? But Paul explains this further in verse 15. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer than the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those members of the body which deem to be less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. What is he saying? There is diversity in the body, and even though you might seem insignificant, you are necessary. Well, I'm not gifted to do something big and flashy. That's great. You're gifted to do something. We need a foot. We need a hand. We need an eye. We need a gallbladder. We need a duodenum. We need, I'm just showing off my useless degree. I'm going to stop. Uh, we need kidneys. There are things that we can do without. If it causes a problem, we get rid of it. But there are certain things that we cannot do without. It is put there for a reason, for a function. And most of the time, we don't think about it until it breaks. Mountain climbers who have gotten frostbite and lost their pinky toes have reported having a problem with balance. Because your pinky toe, even though it doesn't seem that significant, helps keep you upright. Small parts work together for the good of the whole body. Every part is valued, every part is different in different ways. Not everyone is of equal ability, 
but everyone is equally necessary. How many of you watched football yesterday? A few of you. One or two of you. What would happen to your football team if they all of a sudden decided, ah, the center said, nah, I'm not going to block? Oh, yeah. What if the quarterback just showed up that day and said, you know what, I want to be the kicker today? <laughs> Things would fall apart. And it, it seems outrageous, but we see really easily how if one person is not doing what they are designed to do, what they have practiced, what they have made to do, the whole thing starts to fall apart. It doesn't function the way it can. And sometimes you have people who are so spectacularly gifted that they can make up for the failures of somebody else. But that is not the way it is meant to operate. It is estimated that between 20 and 40% of the church, any church, supports the whole thing. Not everyone is supposed to be the same. If we compare ourselves to other people, oh, the eye is saying, oh, I'm not an ear. I must not be that valuable. Well, that's not what you're gifted to do. Maybe some of us don't serve in the church because we are still trying to be something we are not. We're a quarterback trying to be a kicker. We're a kicker trying to be a tackle. We're necessary. And we keep banging our head against the wall wondering, why can't I see? Why can't I see? Why can't I hear? But we don't realize how great we are at listening and talking. Have you ever noticed how incredible you are at asking the right conversations to keep a conversation going? We can be too busy comparing ourselves to other people's giftings that we neglect our own true gifts. We're just not effective when we call ourselves something we are not. We have misidentified who we are. I would encourage you, volunteer. Try stuff. If it's not for you, it's not for you. Try something else. Keep going until you find something, until you find where you are gifted, until you find your place in the church. Because God has gifted you for something. Maybe it's children's ministry. Oh, I don't know. Well, try it. Maybe it's the choir. Try it. Maybe it's greeting people at the door. Try it. Maybe it's something that we don't have yet. Maybe God is laying it on your heart and saying, this is something that we need to be doing. Find a need and meet it. We are all gifted differently. So we talk about structure. We talk about function. Why did the Lord give us these talents in the first place? Let's continue on. Verse 24. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may, may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. The function of the body. Service. We are one, united together. God is the one who balances it all out. He wants us to be unified, not divided. He wants us to be one body, Christ's body, of which he is the head. We are also one so that we can serve. First of all, we serve Christ. Christ. Then we serve each other. If one member suffers, we all suffer. We feel for them. We are, we are to be so unified that we come together. But on the other hand, if one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. It is so easy to bring our pain and our trouble to each other, but how often do we bring our joy and our, 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 the wonders, the things that the Lord is doing in our life to each other and say, let's celebrate together, let's throw a party. Look at the selfless expressions here. We all have times where we go through things that are wrong. We are left in suffering and pain, perhaps even persecuted. But there is also a call to have joy. 
That's an act of service. Joy. It is estimated that most church membership roles are overinflated by a factor of three, which means if you have 300 people on your role, you might, might have 100 people that are actually involved in the church. That means two-thirds of our congregation is disengaged from the church. We are called to be unified because we serve Christ and his body. We need to know who we are, how we are gifted, so that we know how we are to function, so we know where we can get plugged in and serve. We are individual parts of a whole. A member apart from the body does not function. Uh, you say, oh, I'm a Christian, I don't really need the church, though I don't need to organize religion. Well, that's great. You don't just see a you know, leg out there saying, I don't need the rest of the body doesn't function. You are meant to be a part of the body. Look at the way that even 1 Corinthians, all these letters are put, this is sent to the Corinthians. This is sent to a body of believers, and Paul is saying, be unified. Not just globally with the church. Be unified by being a part of a local church. It's possible to not to go to church and still be a Christian, but you'll have a terrible time functioning as one. I'll throw this out there as well. And I mean it with the utmost love. If you come to this church and you are not a member, you are welcome here. We're not going to harass you. We're not going to put the mob out on you. But some of us are calling ourselves a part of this church when we're not. We're saying, yeah, I belong to this church, but you're not engaged. You're not committed. You're trying to do life separate from it. You're trying to pay, pay a membership due and call it good. Where do we serve? Everybody knows that there is no such thing as a part-time organ. Well, guess what? Bodies can accept transplants, organs from another body, but that organ doesn't still belong to the person it came from, right? It becomes a part of your body. That's my heart now. It's my lung now. That's my knee. I, have a, I had neck surgery about seven, eight years ago, and I got a piece of a cadaver in my neck to help keep my structure upright. Guess what? It belongs to me now. Why do I say this? The church I grew up in and was baptized in does not exist anymore. Unfortunately, the church became more obsessed with the gym, a beautiful gym, by the way, they had built this, and they got their eye off the ball of serving the Lord. The vision happened in the church, not for the first time. And the last time I checked, the church is now owned by the Recreation Commission of the town. Oh, yeah, they're using that gym all right. But the church isn't there. They lost their function. What if I told you, that because I grew up there and was baptized there, I consider that to be my true church. You'd look at me like I have three heads. You're weird. Am I nuts? We are really good at coming up with excuses not to commit to something. We're really good at coming up with excuses saying, eh, I belong over here. It's absurd. If you're here, be here. Be a part of the body. Call yourself what you are. I guarantee you not a single one of you want a doctor who is half committed to making you well. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not jealous, it does not brag, it is not arrogant, does not act becoming unbecomingly, does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. He is coming and he's talking about the church. This is coming right on the heels of what we just read. He's talking, love belongs to the unity of the church. We are unified in love. 
We use this passage for marriage, but he is talking about believers with each other. Love each other. Love you, buddy. Now, I've got a little bit of a confession to make this morning. Don't freak out. I didn't do anything like that. But about a year ago, you voted me in as your pastor. And I am still extremely thankful and blessed to be a part of this congregation. You are a great congregation. As far as I'm concerned, on that day, I have been committed to this church. But a lot came at me. It's been a learning curve. I've dropped a few balls here and there. I I have been trying to do my best to keep up with it all. And everything kind of uh, comes at you. And, well, those are just excuses. Had a little boy, takes up a lot of time, and uh, somewhere along the line, my brain fell out of my head, and I realized my wife and I have never actually officially joined this church. Oh, Pastor, you just talked about membership, and you're a hypocrite. (laughs) Well, guess what? I could have tried to sweep it under the rug, but I'm going to own up to it because I would rather lead by example. We are going to make that right this morning. We are going to join this church officially in front of you. My commitment does not change because I have been committed to you, but we want to go through the hoops. We want to be official, and I apologize. I hope you can forgive us for it taking this long. If the Lord has been speaking to you throughout this service, if you are not a member and you want to be a member, I'm going to own up to it. Now's a great time to own up to it. It's, it's hard to be more embarrassed than I've already embarrassed myself, right? So uh, <laughs> you can't make a fool of yourself. Come on down. If you would like to talk about what it means to know the Lord or to be baptized, we would also like to talk with you. I would say let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for members of the body We thank you for your grace and your goodness that you don't want us to be alone. You want us to be a body that is unified and works together for the good of each other. That we are not in isolation trying to make it on our own. We thank you that you are good to us and we pray that we would be exactly that. Unified with you as our head. In your holy, holy name, Lord, we ask and we pray. Amen.